Um, well, sorry, interrupted by the Zoom voice. Um, so uh, welcome everyone to uh, our first Pogo Club of 2022. Um, it's lovely to see you all and I uh, wish those of you I haven't seen a happy new year. Um, today we are discussing the Transforming, government, uh, Transforming Public Procurement uh, Green Paper and focusing in particular on the government's response to the consultation exercise. And of course, those of you who are regularly on these calls will know that um, a working group of the Pogo Club submitted a response um, to that green paper. And uh, some of the ideas that uh, we suggested in that response have been picked up, which is very exciting. Um, so for example, the um, retention of the uh, light touch regime um, and some greater emphasis on social value through um, most advantageous tender rather than most economically advantageous tender and some of those other changes. And the ongoing emphasis on transparency, which was something that we strongly supported whilst recognizing that it does come with additional costs and burdens for participants. Um, but I don't think we quite got the big cultural change that we were hoping for, though I think we were all well aware that we probably wouldn't. Um, so uh, probably still a bit more transactional than relational. Um, but there are lots of things still to uh, figure out with this process. Um, the consultation response um, emphasizes, as we also did, that a lot of this is going to be not so much about the legislative changes, but about the guidance and the training that is going to follow on from that. And so I think there's still lots of opportunity to uh, influence what uh, that is going to look like um, and to get good outcomes um, for more socially focused procurement uh, from that set of arrangements. So um, we've got a fantastic panel to discuss some of these issues and it's going to be chaired for us today by uh, Michael Bauscher QC who we're very delighted to uh, welcome back. Um, so Michael will be known to many of you as a leading barrister at Moncton Chambers in this area and also a visiting professor at King's College London. Um, and he's worked with us before, including on a great session at the Social Outcomes uh, Conference, exploring some of these themes. So um, we've got lots of people on the panel, lots of very exciting speakers. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to shut up and hand over to Michael to uh, kick us off. Thank you very much indeed, Anne. Um, it's great to be here. It's good to see so many friends, experts, colleagues, um, and whether it's, I, I don't know, it's, we're in that stage, we're halfway between Happy New Year and just before Chinese New Year. So it's new, it's, it'll be New Year somewhere sometime soon or was recently. So a Happy New Year to you all. Um, <clears throat> we've got a lot uh, to cover. Um, the the sort of the narrow focus, which raises all so many subjects, is the, where the UK is on its sort of its little journey uh, towards a new transit, tr new transformed public procurement law, and we've got some some commentators on that, and we're then going to try and widen the lens to the the, 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 the wider world, and we have uh, two two friends, Basma Abdul Khalek and Caroline Nicholas, who are going to give a broader perspective, one from Lebanon, one from, from the perspective of Ancetral in Vienna. Um, I'm, and, and so I hope that this way we'll be able to sort of balance up the, the sort of perhaps the important but nonetheless local problems in the, U in, in the UK with um, a sort of wider global context. Just having that global context in mind, it, it is, it's apparent as many have said, and some indeed some of those I can see on, on, on our participants today have commented on their various blogs and so forth, that, that there are, have been a lot of, as it were, outside events, outside procurement, which have really made this a propitious time to look at reform, whether it's COVID and the, 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 as it were, the stress testing that COVID has brought to public procurement law, the, the opportunities around COP26, um, and a number, a range of other issues have, have really brought the importance of improving public procurement law, but also improving public procurement into mind. And um, I have to say, and this is 
I, I, I don't expect, the, 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 I'll, I'll comment a little bit further. I think there are also some wider questions about performance of public contracts and fraud uh, and so forth, which aren't necessarily public procurement specific. Um, and maybe public procurement hasn't paid enough attention to some of those issues, but I think uh, we also need to bear in mind that while we're looking at all of these interesting wider issues, we do also need our contracts to deliver. And one of the one of the things which recent pressures have really put a focus on is, is the difficulty of achieving that. So I, as I say, I'm not going to give long introductions um, to all of our speakers. Most of them have, have bios or summaries on the page for the, the, the meeting. Um, I'll give just sort of th thumbnail sketches, uh, and nor will I do my usual business of trying to embarrass them by telling some interesting personal detail. Uh, we'll save that for another occasion. I did that the last time with some of our participants. Um, maybe we'll have a, a quiz later as to who can remember uh, the, the interesting details that, there were, that, that, that were offered up last time. Um, <clears throat> so our first three speakers will be looking at um, at the UK transformation. What I've asked them to do is really identify just in a couple of minutes the, the thing, one or two points which they're very pleased with and one or two things which still disappoint them. And I hope that if we go around those three, that will then give us some material to, for, for a discussion. Uh, we're then very privileged to have Lindsay McGuire from the Cabinet Office, who's uh, head of in, in, in engagement in this whole procurement reform process. And she will, um, I, I'm, I'm not, she, 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 I'll leave it to her how, how she feel able, feels able to respond, uh, if at all, but I'll leave her to, to comment as she feels able to what's being done that, although I reserve the right to put a bit of pressure on if I, if, if I, if I feel, feel, feel the mood, um, if I feel the mood, the mood comes over me. Um, but without more ado, therefore, let's, let's dive in. Uh, our first speaker, by, we, I think the, the vote was that our first, the first commentator was going to be Kieran McGochie, who is the solicitor, who is uh, the solicitor at New, Newcastle City Council, but also, um, I can't remember your title, Kieran, are you convener chair uh, of the lawyers in local government? Anyway, the, all things on lawyers in local government come by, by Kieran, um, and he has been very much responsible for running the response of lawyers in local government to this whole process. Um, it's obviously very important that we hear what um, what that can what, what that section of deals thinks about the whole process because they're the ones who are actually going to have to be doing the hard work of making this thing work, probably more so in terms of overall value than central government. So, Kieran, without more ado, let me turn over to you. Yes, uh, thanks very much for the introduction, Michael. And likewise, uh, thanks for the Oxford Pogo Club for the invitation to, to speak today. Um, it's great to be here and to see so many people on the call. So as Michael says, I'm a director of an organization called Lawyers and Local Government. I'm conscious we've got people from around the world on the call today. So LLG, Lawyers and Local Government, we are a membership organization, does exactly what it says in the Tim, we're a membership body for local government lawyers based in England and Wales. And for my sins in my day job, I am indeed one of those local government lawyers here at Newcastle City Council. So as Michael said, we responded in, at length to the Green Paper and I was responsible for coordinating that response on behalf of the four to 5,000 members we have uh, of local government lawyers across England and Wales. So that was really setting out our thoughts and flagging up uh, a number of key concerns that we had with the proposals uh, as was. Um, those arose both from our members and not only their own personal views, but I think their learned experiences of the, the clients and local government bodies that they advise. So those uh, concerns tend to focus on a number of core themes. So the first one was a, a perceived national bias in terms of central government amongst the reforms. There was a lot of talk in the early days about national priority outcomes, national policy objectives, not really much consideration it seemed given to local uh, policies and um, procurement objectives. 
The other one then, uh, really one of the, the big ones was the resource implications of the reforms, particularly related to the transparency agenda and the increased need to uh, publish uh, notices and other uh, evaluation information, for example. And finally, one of the other concerns was around greater uncertainty. Um, you know, whether or not uh, having a more flexible regime uh, is a good or a bad thing, you know, is, is a topic for debate. Um, but I think either way, more uncertainty does result in more work in terms of having to develop a more bespoke process rather than something off the shelf. So anyway, I've been asked today to talk about the government's response and looking back at those concerns that we raised last year, does the government's response address some or all of those concerns? Um, which I think is a very good question. I think the short answer is that most of our concerns would remain, although we do note and welcome the progress in some areas. So for example, thinking back to those core themes of last year, the central government focus, I think, is less of an issue than it was. We have seen in the government's response, the plans for a central oversight unit, those have been watered down. It will now be about investigation and recommendation rather than intervention. We've also seen since the Green Paper was published uh, last year, the publication of the MPPS, the National Procurement Policy Statement. And quite helpfully, that does also reference and cite the existence of local priorities, which can be considered, albeit alongside national priorities. So I think amongst our members, that, that is an area where the, the changes uh, are welcome and the thinking has moved on. Um, that leaves them principally two areas in terms of resource implications and greater un uncertainty for some of the really the, the key concerns probably remain. It is important to note that uh, out of fairness and also because Lindsay is here that the government have uh, you know progressed some of those ideas. So for example, you won't need to disclose the full tender in, pro in future procurement processes, rather certain evaluation documents. Uh, it had been suggested that you might have to publish the whole thing, uh, warts and all, subject to any uh, commercial sensitivity redactions. Uh, and also the publication of the actual contract documents is now going to be set at a 2 million threshold, so it won't apply to every contract. So um, those are uh, welcome shifts from a local government perspective. What I would say is that those are fairly minor changes and the uh, response still represents a very significant shift uh, between what the law is as it stands today and what it will be um, you know, next year or, or 2024 when the new law does become uh, effective in, in England and Wales. So whereas some of the items being released might have been teased out in the past via freedom of information and request, local authorities like my own in future are going to have to you know, be much more proactive in every single case of getting all that information out there. We are going to be publishing a, a whole host of notices. I think anyone who uh, has been through the government's response will have noticed that, uh, pardon the pun. So in future, you know, you might be publishing a notice to tell uh, that a contract has expired uh, and then one to say you have awarded a contract and then a second different notice as to what KPIs apply in that case. So. I, I do wonder about you know the, the logic of some of this. Um, for example, publishing a notice just to tell someone a, a contract has expired, is that really moving uh, you know procurement outcomes forward? Could that, for example, not have been uh, covered off within a pre-market engagement notice or indeed the advert? Because you know most procurements that we do tend to be you know repetitive uh, procurements where we've been out to tender a few years previously. The, the award notice, the notice about the KPIs, I, I did wonder if that could all have been consolidated into a single notice. So again, I think that the resource implications of all of this can't be understated. They also have to be viewed through the, the prism of the ongoing financial austerity many councils find ourselves in. Um, fingers crossed and, and, and touch wood, we're coming out of the, the back of a pandemic, but that's been a, a major resource drain for many local authorities. It also comes at the back of you know, a decade of severe budget cuts from central government funding afforded to local government in England and Wales. So rather understandably, the, the purse, tights, purse uh, strings rather do tend to be grasped rather tightly. So anything which entails more work and more staff is understandably a source of concern. Uh, finally, the thought I will leave you with is if you go on to the website of the Green Paper Response, 
one of the very simple short comments is that the government aims to speed up and simplify procurement. Uh, and based on some of the, the aspects of pointed out as above, I'm just not convinced that the, the new transpar transparency agenda will seek to achieve those outcomes. Thank you. Elementary, the thought after two years, I'd have, I'd have got learned not to make that mistake. Apologies. Um, some things are never old. Um, uh, so at random, Gavin, would you like to, uh, get to sort of make comment, make your comments from your perspective? Gavin Heyman is executive director of the Open Contracting Partnership. He also, the, the, the OCP also put in a very substantial response um, to the Green Paper obviously promoting the open contracting approach to um to procurement maybe gavin where do, where do you think we are now what, what what what's your what's your scorecard at the moment sure so we've always been very ambitious for the uk reforms right it's a once in a generation opportunity to genuinely transform public procurement in the uk yeah like a, the british government isn't where it wants to be we have an incredibly fragmented you know like a a set of rules covering public procurement. So there was a real opportunity to like bring everything together in one clear rule book, set one clear set of rules, and really get much better information about both the kind of planning, the actual tender of the warning, and delivery and performance of public contracts. And, and by and large, the original agenda was really positive on that. I think it's mostly intact um, based upon the kind of consultation response. So Public procurement reform is always hard. They're always going to be competing interests. The 600 kind of plus consultations the government had to go through sort of show the depth of public interest. In. And let's remember, we've just been through the whole COVID emergency procurement situation, and we've seen just how much the UK has struggled. Yeah. Other countries were able to um, create simple frameworks, bring everybody onto those, and call off the uh, you know, COVID contracts in relation to that, publish information in 24 hours, the UK 100 days plus and we still haven't worked out who got which contract and whether it was fair or not. So, so there's important lessons. I think the government is learning them and I think the agenda broadly is intact. Uh, chapter six was on open and transparent procurement. I think by and large that's all still in there. The whole concept is of those new notices covering the entire commercial cycle. I think the secret now in really getting good delivery of those is working with people like Karen to make it less extracted transparency and more about actually giving people at the front line of public procurement better information to do their jobs better and how we can automate things and make things smarter. So I think it's a very important piece now to work with uh, frontline procurement people, but also with the e-senders and e-procurement platforms, the 80 plus that people are using in this incredibly fragmented UK landscape to bring those together. And chapter six has still that idea of the single record so you can actually work out where procurements are, how they're delivering and what's happening. And obviously that's super important for the POGO community um, that we can actually begin to see better planning and actually much better kind of uh, actual information about delivery of contracts. Are we achieving our KPIs on them? So as I said, let's not be extractive about it. Let's try to really you know, make sure that it's kind of uh, everything is born digital there's a single source of truth and a single kind of entry of that truth that yeah, actually sort of helps extract the information. I think um, that's mostly in there. The government is planning now to bring out this, um, this uh, single platform, um, the Telesponse principle. I think that is great, but work needs to start now across the community to really make sure that vision is delivered successfully. Done well, it can be a huge time saver. We've seen, you know, like transformation affect other countries, you know, like a, Baz will be sharing Lebanon's experience in how to kind of go digital. Um, I think that will be really interesting. There are lots of smart people on, on the POGO community who have a commentary on that. Let me touch on just a couple other areas that I know I have to be short. Other things that have moved forward with the debarment regime has been clarified. I think that's really good. Yeah, how do we deal with fraud and bad actors is obviously an incredibly important topic given um, the resignation of uh, Lord Agnew this week that perhaps we can all talk about a bit more uh, as a community. I think um, the competitive flexible procedure gives a lot more flexibility to local authorities. You need to check things have been done well and been done properly, and that there's still a fair level playing field for awarding contracts, which is why you need that kind of additional disclosure to check what's going on. And you need the PRU, the Procurement Review Unit, that's going to sit within the Cabinet Office 
be able to oversee where the policies and procedures are not being implemented properly. So I think the boundary is being drawn quite clearly there. I would like to see the PRU being very data driven, having a very clear mandate to be able to like, you know, check what's going on, intervene where there's kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, like systematic um, misunderstandings or misapplication of the rules. Um, and, you know, like having the proper resources to do this. I think that's important. I think resources will be vital across the whole of the, uh, yeah, the uh, transformation agenda on public procurement, right? We're not just going to have a couple of digital training courses. We genuinely need that investment. It is an investment because the return on that would be huge, given you're talking about the single largest pot of spending in government, and we know it's not being spent in the way perhaps we, we ideally want at the moment. And then very last comments, um, there's obviously the emergency procurement regime that has changed in the response, and I sort of welcome seeing the actual rules about how it's going to work in practice. Um, there's still the ambition that you don't just go straight to sole sourcing, that you can still do competitive limited time bound tenders. I think that's a really good ambition. I think making sure that's still uh, the case when the rules actually come out is really important. And the very last comment, which I think is a shame that has rode backwards, is the complaints mechanism. There was a, a real ambition to have a, a, a smarter kind of, you know, complaints mechanism to solve problems before the tenders are kind of awarded and things kind of go wrong. And there's going to be this kind of accelerated tribunal that's been rode back on. The, the regime is not quite clear yet. The government says it's going to consult further. It's right to think about these things, but um, I would hate to see it just stay as it is. I think that's, if we don't um, enable faster and quicker resolution of complaints, that's going to be deterring all other innovation and flexibility elsewhere in the system. So with that, I, I will uh, you know, let others uh, hold forth too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gavin, that's terrific. Um, before so picking up some of the questions, before we get there, though, let's have our third sort of initial comment. Um, I believe that uh, Julian Blake is here, although I cannot see him, but Lee tells me he's here. Are we re is Julian, are you ready to contribute? Again, if you're able, if you would be I am, able. I am here. Yeah. There you are, brilliant, okay. Yeah. If you were able to, again, your sort of scorecard, the, the, the couple of things you're happy with and the couple of things you're grumbling about. Yep, very good. Okay, I, I like the reference early on in the uh, response, which said that, observed that the European regime uh, was primarily focused on the single market, um, but I'm disappointed that that competition law frame hasn't changed. It's still about the market. And my perspective is very much from um, public services and public benefit providers of public services and procurement doesn't work very well from that perspective as matters stand. I put representations in from a social enterprise group, E3M. I also worked with um, Never More Needed, which is an umbrella set of umbrella groups from the charity sector. And I put in a section, I think, of the um, Procurement Lawyers Association report. Also, the House of Lords Public Services Committee picked up on some of the points that we were making um, and made representations. Um, through, through that route. Um, the main point is uh, about the purpose alignment, um, the uh, inherent social value um, that comes through collaboration and partnership between providers and um, public authorities, um, focusing on public services. And that's not what a market frame looks like for, for a very significant reason, which a lot of the public service areas are not pure markets or they're quasi markets or they're not markets at all, but the procurement regime is still there. What's not added to that is the concept that commissioning is a much wider subject than public procurement. And what we were asking for was for that recognition. What was good uh, was the reversal of the um, removal of the light touch regime. That was good in a qualified way because that's the only place in the current regime where you can see that public services of a particular type are treated differently or can be treated differently from other types of commercial purchasing. So we were saying, that if, if, if that's the only thing in the current rules that focuses on that area, please retain it, um, but ideally uh, extend the concept and uh, add more differentiation into the way public services might be treated. Um, so we've got the status quo back, the light touch regime, um, that's good uh, as far as it goes. Um, a slight concern on that is the 
reference to the light touch range scheme coming back, it looked a bit limited. It, it was talking about care and it was talking about special education. Um, I'd suggest that there are other public service areas for which this flexibility is just as important. So it would be disappointing to feel that the light touch regime actually comes back in a narrower form. Um, I'm very disappointed that the, the innovation partnership is lost or seemingly lost since that was a was the, the, one of the most positive things from the public service, public se uh, sector, public benefit sector uh, perspective that came out of the 2015 reforms because that's about collaboration and that's about partnership and it's about early initiate uh, early engagement and it's about the potential for um, initiation of good ideas and innovation to come from somewhere else than the public sector so the, in the innovation may come from the provider sector in which case you want a way of engaging and the innovation partnership was a way towards that happening and was helpful in those terms but that seems not to be taken by um, the review um, now, what this really means is um, that with the competitive flexible procedure, that seems to open up all of the possibilities that I've just been describing in theory. Um, in fact, it might even have extended to cover light touch regime things because you could be so flexible within the competitive flexible process to include light touch regime approaches and innovation partnership approaches. So that's really where the focus if, 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 if the um, legislation comes through in the same form as what is proposed here, that suggests to me that all the things I'm saying would need to be uh, focused in on the idea that the flexibility in the new flexible procedure is flexible enough to cover these things, to cover different approaches to public services, recognition of um, partnership and collaboration approaches, wider approaches, not just including um, service contracts, uh, but partnership arrangements, um, a whole approach to social value and, and such like. And a slight concern there, uh, although guidance and templates being issued as is proposed is obviously a good idea up to a point, if guidance and templates are taken as narrowing the focus down as they could easily be, you can work within the guidance, you can work with the template, but, but something that hasn't been thought of within the guidance or the templates is difficult to do, then we'll be back to where we are at the moment, um, which is as recognized by the report. It says a lot of the things here are implementation challenges, not about the regulations. They're about behavioral issues, not about the regulations. Totally true, because there's a lot of flexibility in the current regime that is not taken advantage of. And the risk I see is that the new regime, despite being called flexible, will similarly not take full advantage of the flexibility and cover these issues. So that's what I'm really counting on, or what my the, the, the sector I, I advocate for is counting on, that the flexibility is broad enough to accommodate their concerns. I think that also means a very important thing, which is um, to pick up a point that Kieran was making, the idea that it does mean more work, it does mean things that are more bespoke, because more professional judgment and less mechan mechanistic um, assessments uh, are required for this greater sensitivity to real issues to come into play when we're talking about public services. So overall, it's about the desirable, the, what's desirable from the public benefit perspective and the public service perspective to see more collaborative approaches and partnership approaches developing. The flexible regime may allow for it, but it doesn't sort of explicitly describe it. Fantastic, Julian. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm going to try and call on one or two people to sort of comment before we move on to uh, the, 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 the next group of speakers. Um, but I, perhaps in fairness to, to, to everyone, the, 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 you know, the couple of references you've heard to um, the minister resigning and its relevance, and I, to those not from the UK, I should explain, the, the minister responsible for procurement reform, and therefore I infer up until yesterday, Lindsay's boss, political boss, uh, rather spectacularly resigned in the House of Lords yesterday, resigned his position as minister, not specifically for anything to do with public procurement, but because he was expressing considerable unhappiness with the way in which government generally uh, was addressing uh, the growing sense that there's an had been an enormous amount of fraud uh, in connection with the 
loans that were put in place to help business survive the pandemic. Um, and I'm personally very, very much aware that the there's some some really some really fantastic resource within cabinet office to do, do in the counter fraud area. And one of his specific complaints was that the rest of government just re specifically said that the rest of government was refusing to engage with the counter fraud experts in government and sort of um, um, and deliberately sort of ignoring the problem. Um, accepting that counter cabinet office does have that resource. If I may just make one observation and just to leave it ha hang there if anyone wants to pick it up. Uh, we, in, at, a, at an event with George Washington, probably 18 months ago at the beginning of the crisis, um, we had a speaker from the cabinet office make the observation and he'd just come back from looking at the uh, Australian bushfires crisis, that there was going to be lots of there were, there were going to be lots of counter fraud challenges coming up. And I just wonder whether or not the legislative reform has adequately taken account of what we have learned about the problems of managing fraud in public procurement. I'm not sure, just looking at what has happened in some of the ongoing cases, that we Certainly, the current law doesn't isn't much help. It doesn't doesn't do a great deal. But I'm not sure that we really see much that specifically addresses that. But maybe I'd be if, if you think I'm wrong, I would welcome thoughts on that. Um, picking on no one in picking on various people in particular, but I maybe Albert Sanchez Grails has got a number of useful points, and I wondered Albert, on both resources and uh, flexibility. Um, and how that may change. I wonder, Albert, do you want to elaborate briefly on the points you've been raising in the chat? Thank you, Michael, and, and thanks all the speakers for a very useful presentation. I, I just think that from the beginning, it was pretty clear that this process of deregulation is gonna create complexity, and this complexity can have positives, so flexibility, but it's gonna also create both risks, which contracting authorities are not very comfortable with, and that links to the issue of remedies that, that Gavin was, was addressing. So if, if remedies don't change, probably practice won't change. And also links to the issue of how capable they are of taking advantage of these issues. So, so I think I just, sometimes the problem is that we're just discussing the specifics and, and, and we are not addressing the elephant in the room. We don't have a quantification of how much more people and, and time we need to make these things happen. And I, I would like to see that, for example. Yeah, well, that's a very, there is a lot of sort of, um, there are a number of ones where we're sort of reforming against an uncertain background in a number of areas. Um, I mean, I can pick up, another, maybe I can just throw out another point, which picks up the enforcement point, which um, has been made on more than one occasion already. Um, certainly, if we are looking at a, a greater content in procurement, we're facing so social outcomes, sustainable outcomes, and so forth, we're going to be looking inevitably at a number of issues which bidders themselves may not have a direct interest in enforcing. It may be that, uh, that, that bidders are largely neutral as to what the content of the bid documents are going to be. Um, and this raises an important question as to who's going to enforce and how the, the changes on enforcement from the PPRS going to a more policy-based uh, enforcement approach wouldn't deal with a case-by-case -case set of problems. And uh, for those geeks like me who have to read, 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 read boring cases, you may have picked up in the recent public first judgment, that's the one about Dominic Cummings, um, a throwaway remark from the judge, but it's not any old judge, it's the Lord Chief Justice, that maybe standing rules are too broad and that the time has come to look at that again. Well, if the standing rules, I mean, who knows what will happen next, but if the standing rules for challenging breaches of procurement law and policy are narrowed and the Public Procurement Review Service is only looking at broad policy, policy and sort of broad strokes, who's actually going to mind the shop on what happens in one procurement or another? Again, I throw that out as a question. Um, so uh, we've got oh, 10 new messages, crikey. Uh, Lee, we, you, you, you're following them. Who should we, uh, who should we throw who, who should we throw in the deep end? Well, we've got a couple in the chat room. Um, our 
we do have Malcolm with a virtual hand raised, so I wonder, and he hasn't uh, pitched in on the um, oh, the comment. Right. Malcolm, do you want to? If, that, if that's your hand, is it right? Brilliant. Dive yeah. in. And unmute first. Just, uh, I was just typing something as you spoke. Um, as many of you know, my particular focus has been about innovation and innovation procurement. Uh, I want to support very much what Julian said about my regret that we've not been allowed to develop the competitive partnership, uh, innovation partnership. And I'd also remark, by the way, that, uh, of course, the 2014 legislation of which I had a, a major role uh, was um, contained a number of new procedures to drive innovation, uh, which are actually developing very successfully. Uh, and I think my major concern is uh, that the response to the Green Paper, I think, dealt with the points made about the problems of the fact the competitive flexible procedure will only work with extensive range of guidance notes. Uh, and in, in, the, in the procedure, it says, um, we will put in, the re in response, we will put more emphasis on planning and pre-market engagement. Well, I mean, the government doesn't do procurements, uh, it does its own procurements, but I mean, it, local government, for example, um, where we want to encourage that is going to need far more guidance. And um, I, I think the fact that this, this the, the guidance simply says that um, a flexible procedure will automatically deliver more innovation and gives us an example, the ventilator procurement, which as I understand it was done under the existing rules. Thank you, Malcolm. Um, we do need to, to battle on because it's um, within time. Uh, let me just pick up one remark, which I'm just going to call out without necessarily asking for, um, is the um, reference from Peter Smith about concerns about more use of frameworks, maybe not, not maybe not, and implicitly in his comment, in not improper use, use, more improper use of frameworks. Um, I, I, that sort of nicely chimes with some of the thoughts that I've been reading uh, in um, Professor Mario Comba's book, Centralizing Public Procurement, which you can't read, see that, but I've got it here, and Mario is here online. There's some interesting thoughts in there about the proper use of public procurement. And again, I think we all have a lot, a, a lot of new lessons to learn. And I do wonder whether or not the section on centralized procurement might, might also merit from a little bit of um, brushing up in light of some of our COVID experience. Um, but that's a bit kept for the future. And we given what we have on the agenda, I perhaps we'll, we'll come back to that if we have time, but maybe we can move on. Can I, having thrown out all of these challenges and difficulties, can I uh, call on Lindsay Maguire, who I know is here somewhere, I can't see her on my thing, uh, who is, as I've, I've already indicated, head of in, um, head of engagement in, in the cabinet office in this process. And I'll leave it to Lindsay to tell us what she feels able to tell us and respond to what she feels able to respond to. Yes, of course. Hi. Thanks, Michael. Um, really, really interesting discussion. Thank you so much. Um, and all really valid points, which um, are definitely on our list of things that we know we need to grapple with over the next few months. Um, so it was quite interesting to hear that the, uh, you know, how we're pitching this is that, you know, legislation is actually only the first step um, and having an implementation program and having learning and development and building our capability and looking at resources and you know working out what that wraparound support um, that program is actually running in parallel to the work that we're doing at the moment so we've got the legislation happening on one hand but on the other hand we are looking at all of those behavioral aspects and we've always been clear that the success of this reform is going to be dependent on that and it's going to be dependent on um, procurement professionals coming with us on that journey and focusing on what they need for the capability. It's quite early days um, but as we go forward there's definitely going to be um, some work that we need to do on uh, you know engaging and, and making sure that we, we've captured what that needs to look like. At the moment um, we can't even figure out how many people we're talking about. So it could be anything from 4,000 people to 20,000 people if you think about how many individuals actually touch the whole procurement life cycle as we go through. Um, but that's incredibly important. And 
alongside that, um, and I think this answers some of the specific questions around flexibility and also on transparency is um, what will be in the baseline of the legislation um, is one thing, but then it's it is guidance, it's scenario planning, it's looking at all of the ways that procurement could work under the new procedures. Um, and we have to do a bit of work on that. But I totally recognize Julian's point that actually, if you do too much guidance, if you do too much scenario planning, effectively you're restricting, um, you know, you're restricting that innovation and you end up with quite a bland, uh, new procedure so getting the balance right on that is quite tricky and what we've started doing is effectively pooling loads of examples of what innovative procurement looks like and what it would need to look like in the in the future and we're mapping all of that through so we've got um, various experts that we're engaging with on that but we will be looking for in the future um, some more ideas on how to make sure that those uh, guidance products and that level of flexibility is reflected in some of the um, the, the products. So this group um, seems like it would be a great starting point for some of that stuff. So I'm certain we'll be talking a bit more about this in the future. Um, uh, just on transparency, uh, I totally recognise the, the, the concern around burdens and the concern around resource. Um, I think, Gavin, you mentioned that our idea is that whilst more information be required to be published, it's not, it's not information that is new. It's not information that inconceivably a procurement team shouldn't have anyway. So if we can make the, the process of publication easier, if we can provide um, notices, if we could pro provide standard tools, if we can make our whole system integrate in a much more effective way, um, then we're going to make it easier. Now, that doesn't mean that there won't be a bit of a ramp up and there may be some additional resource required. But once you reach that steady state, everything will be much more fluid and it will give people the information that they need to then raise challenges um, and follow the complaints mechanism in a much smoother way. So transparency isn't just about announcing what we're doing to the public and to you know holding government to account as taxpayers it's also about creating a regime that links everything together so that um, challenges become easier and hopefully that will change behaviors um, but I totally appreciate that it's a long-term uh, it's a long-term project and getting the the, 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 the bits in uh, the, all of the different steps in um, so we get to that point is going to be part of the process um, but that is something that we're looking at in parallel and a lot of this will actually sit within secondary legislation so there will be another process to actually look at implementation and we can talk contracting authorities through that um, so those were just a couple of things that I, I pulled out from the discussions um, but just in terms of next steps uh, you know we're, we're cognizant of all of this stuff uh, Lord Agnew leaving admittedly has left us in a little bit of a a slight panic about some of our time scales. Um, we were very dependent on him uh, championing it and taking things uh, forward. Um, but we are looking to hopefully have uh, something to introduce within the next four or five months. Um, we've got some really good stakeholder updates that we're, we're doing at the moment. So um, if you want to you know, be involved in that, I can share a form which you can fill out if you haven't done already. Um, and then as soon as we've got a clear idea of timescales, we can start looking at implementation, we can start looking at um, guidance and we can bring everyone in that we need to bring in in that process. Um, we're definitely aware that this is um, not a case of just introducing something to Parliament and letting it go. We want to make sure that we actually are harnessing all of the good bits. Otherwise, um, you know, as commercial people, will end up in the same position as we are now, which will be a complete waste of everyone's time. Um, I think I'll leave it there unless anyone's got any question or I'll pass back to Michael. And I know that there's some interesting topics coming up. Thank you, Lindsay. I just one quick question. Do you have a clear line on how this is going to apply to Northern Ireland and Scotland or is that still a discussion? Um, so uh, Scotland have indicated that they want to do their own regulations. And we are working um, with their policy officials, however, to make sure that we're as, as aligned as we possibly can be. Um, Northern Ireland uh, got approval to join uh, our bill just before Christmas. Um, there may be some nuances in how it's applied. Uh, uh, the same goes for Wales, who've also given indication. Um, but we've got uh, uh, stakeholders sort of involved from the policy side. So we're working very closely with this DA. Oh, you're on mute. Michael, on mute again. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. 
uh, yeah, there's interesting issues around the protocol when you get into Northern Ireland, but let's park those interesting questions for the moment. Um, so, uh, we, this isn't just a, a United Kingdom problem. We're not the only place trying to sort out our law. Um, so it's huge privilege and pleasure to have Abbasma Abdul Kalak with us, who has joined us previously and is going to tell us, give us an update as to where we've got to. I'm not going to, as if we've, 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 we, we know Basma from, from, previous, from our previous event. So take it away, Basma. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm happy and proud to, to join you again at Oxford University on this call. Thank you, Google Grab, for this invitation. Uh, for those who don't, who don't know me, I'm Basma Abdel Khali. I'm an economist at the Institute of Finance, Basil Bayhan in Lebanon. Uh, our institute is a policy and the learning hub uh, of public financial management uh, in Lebanon and is leading on public procurement reform since 2019, mandated by the Minister of Finance. Uh, we have been learning about the UK experience throughout several meetings and uh, thanks to all the experts uh, who, are be, uh, who are sharing um, this transformation process in the UK. Uh, in Lebanon, it's, a bit, it's also a transformation process, but, but the context is a bit different. Uh, if you allow me just to brief you about a little bit about our situation before giving some updates on the reform process. Uh, the reform in Lebanon uh, is driven by national priorities, uh, which are to put Lebanon back on track of economic recovery after the 2019 uh, economic and financial crisis that hit the country. Uh, today, in a recent report that was launched today by the World Bank, uh, GDP, GDP contraction in the country is estimated at 58%. Uh, we are ha the highest contraction in, in the economy in a list of 193 countries around the world. Uh, we have been losing uh, our potential, uh, destruction of our uh, social, social and economic networks. Our, our talents are leaving the country. Uh, we are experiencing an average of 145% uh, of inflation, uh, estimated to be the third globally after Venezuela and Sudan. So uh, to put Lebanon back on the track of recovery, uh, public procurement reform is a key reform agenda that was committed by, uh, by the government of Lebanon in 2018 and by the international community who is uh, supporting and willing to support this reform. Uh, public procurement size in Lebanon is 20% of expenditures of central government, uh, not counting uh, public institutions, uh, agencies, and uh, municipalities, which makes it a big, big potential for economic recovery and to ensure value for money and, and efficiency. And for sure, also public procurement is on the uh, agenda of anti-corruption and transparency as a core component. Uh, since Lebanon uh, ha has corruption as a big problem, uh, as a high risk area, uh, it, it costs us annually uh, $10 billion uh, as a cost of corruption estimation, uh, $5 billion as direct costs, of waste, of public money waste, and five other million billion dollars annually as loss of economic opportunities for businesses. So, uh, and for uh, not ease in doing business in the country and for losing economic competitiveness. So all these challenges uh, has led us to think procurement uh, differently and giving it a strategic uh, approach. Uh, since uh, procurement is a, is a big area for government to spend money, um, uh, government has the power to influence competition, uh, to reduce the risk of illegal practices, uh, which causes authorities to overpay when buying goods and services. And also procurement uh, could help government lead by example and to encourage, as you were saying, green procurement, inclusive procurement transactions, but gender procurement and uh, social procurement. And today uh, we had a very interesting roundtable discussion at parliament uh, parliamentarians, with our uh, partners in civil society, uh, also with UN Women and other international partners on how to um, implement the new law that I will be briefing you on uh, from a gender perspective to, to encourage women participation in the economic panorama in Lebanon. So uh, law uh, 244 was enacted last year in June um, 2021. Uh, it's, a, it's a key instrument for uh, better financial governance uh, in Lebanon. Uh, when we were mandated to lead on this reform uh, agenda, uh, we uh, designed a transformative path for public procurement reform. This approach is based on three main pillars. The first pillar is evidence. The second is principles. And the third is 
uh, emerging of all concerned stakeholders and actors in this reform. On evidence, we base our, our approach, our design on the results and recommendation of the MAPS assessment, which is the methodology for assessing procurement, uh, procurement system recognized as an international tool for reform. Uh, we base ourselves on other benchmarks from countries in the Arab region that preceded us and uh, did a big um, uh, achievement on this procurement reform, such as Tunisia, Egypt, Jordan, Palestine, and others. We based ourselves on the principles, international guidelines, and uh, practices, mainly the UNCITRAL model law and the OECD 12 principles and recommendations on public procurement. Uh, third, the transformation process was really a big change here in how the philosophy of uh, uh, putting policy uh, policy reform on track is to engage uh, also the policymakers in this process. So it was uh, really a long process at Parliament and discussing the law, bringing in evidence to policymakers, explaining to them what is public procurement about, how should the system work, how to abide by international good practices, and this was really a challenge that we uh, we succeeded in uh, in um, in overcoming this uh, through um, uh, the help of national, a roster of national experts and practitioners and specialists and of international also experts who gave us <laughs> technical, technical assistance on that. Uh, so uh, after two uh, years of drafting, reviews, consultations and parliamentary debates, we have now a unified law, law 244. Uh, we have ticked the box for this first milestone and now we are preparing the ground for the law entry into force on August 1st 2022. We have less than six months to go uh, to start law implementation. So uh, to prepare for this sound implementation, uh, a national strategy for public procurement reform was uh, developed based on uh, the results of the MAPS assessment and also based on the uh, provisions of this law. Uh, this um, strategy is built on four main strategic objectives that are shown on the slide, uh, tackling the legal um, framework, uh, the institutional framework, the practices, and also all what is related to uh, enhancing the accountability, integrity, and transparency framework in the procurement system. Uh, the, the, the good news is that this national strategy was officially launched uh, last week on Thursday um, um, in the presence of the presidents of the Council of Ministers in Lebanon, the Minister of Finance, and all the international community. So um, I'm happy to say uh, that there is a reform uh, agenda. Uh, we have put a two-year uh, timeline for this reform to be um, to, to advance over the short term, which are priority actions before entry uh, into force of the law, and others of medium term that will last until uh, 2024. And the challenge now for the country is to meet all, all this deadline. So for this purpose, the national strategy has um, designed a, a reform management matrix where we, um, we tried um, in the consultation process with all the stakeholders holders to define what are the components to work on. And as you were saying in your UK uh, model, uh, that uh, legislation is not enough. So uh, a lot of work has to be done on complementary legislation, guidelines, standard documents, forms and templates to be put at disposition of public sector and of the business community as well. A lot of training, a lot of awareness uh, to, to, for, for people to start understanding the provision of this law and how to implement it. So all these, all these efforts need, uh, need to be to be counted, uh, and also we I have to mention that we have uh, two new authorities created in the system, which are the regulatory authority that will be responsible for all the procurement policies, for the regulatory, for making sure that the system is working um, as per the law and that all standards are um, respected, which is the public procurement authority, and another new authority that is uh, key for the business community and to restore trust, which is the complaint authority. And these two new authorities, if they are not formed on time and trained and well equipped with assistance needed, there is a high risk that um, the law will not be implemented as we aim to. So uh, these are also a very key components that we hope to uh, bring um, into implementation uh, with the help of our partners and of, of um, uh, a community of experts and practitioners like you that, that we count on uh, keeping the exchange with you open, uh, peer-to-peer peer, uh, peer -peer exchange and learning from exchange 
experiences in order to help Lebanon uh, advance on this uh, reform agenda. And finally, I would like to um, say that I will be sharing in the chat uh, a piece of article that we wrote, Lamia Mbayed, the president of the Institute, and myself on this, uh, the documents to see from sources uh, for you to um, read more and have more information. And I'm also happy to answer any clarification or question you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Basma. Um, so we're running a little bit tight on time. Um, so Caroline, take us the whole way around the world in 80 seconds plus. No, you've got more than 80 seconds, but you know, around the world, tell us what's going on. What should we be thinking about in terms of reform? Okay, well, thanks a lot, everybody. Um, fascinating stuff. I won't uh, take up too many seconds by saying it. Um, I'm going to focus just on one particular aspect, and that is the central dichotomy between saying we're going to simplify and standardize and making everything more com complex, because these days procurement's going to solve corruption, save the world, be green and all the rest of it. Um, and social outcomes in particular are really hard. So I want just to emphasize something that Gavin said about standardizing things and speaking as a lawyer, we really go for tools, not rules. Mm. Um, and, and the idea of turning your rules into sort of process steps that can help generate the sorts mm. of automated uh, generation of some publication information, automated generation of report information that can allow um, the sort of internal transparency that whoever, whoever's talking about, um, um, that allows for um, enforcement action and so on. That's a really, really key thing that I think is often overlooked. In terms of a couple of, of really concrete points that we've seen coming up in the sort of COVID experience. The first is that um, nobody fills out records separately while they're doing a bustingly urgent procurement. So most procurement records that we see are ex post facto and aren't really complete. Going back to Michael's point about incentives to enforce, what you can't challenge what you don't know about, and there's a lot of issues about that, but not all of those issues are, can be solved in the procurement context, because a lot of those issues were not really procurement issues, they were dealing with a failing market. So whoever said that this should be put into the broader context and interaction, I think is something that's, that's very right. And also we have seen that, irrespective of questions of standing, unless, you regularly see contract awards overturned, suppliers aren't going to challenge. So you lose part of that discipline that you're talking about. What does two other things that, that strike me, I'm sorry, I'm just running through a laundry list and I'm always happy to talk about these more. Um, now that the UK is out of the EU single market, but is part of the GPA, the importance of using below threshold procurements, going back to what was said right at the beginning at local government level, where you have a lot more flexibility to look at a national sort of policy is often underestimated. It's perfectly acceptable in GPA terms. Um, and the other thing that I will close on saying is about incentives and investment. Every time I go and work, and I'm, Basma knows all about this, because every time you start a process of procurement reform, Money is, if not no object, there's plenty of money available. And so the early bits are well resourced and everybody's committed and so on. And as time goes on, priorities change and often the bits that are most difficult, which are done at the end, are done when there's no resources left and that has a huge impact. So um, for the cabinet office, any, I think you're, you're absolutely right to talk about the importance of the things that you did. And I hope that you're going to be funded, not just for the initial two years of excitement, but for the longer term, because this is an ongoing investment. And the, the very last thing about complexity and particularly social outcomes and, and flexibility and encouraging commercial discretion. If individual procurement officials continue to be measured in terms of performance, the way that they've traditionally been measured, how many contracts have you got through without problems in the last year? If that's your performance measure, no one's going to take any commercial risks. It's not worth it because the, the personal risk lies with an individual. Any benefits lie somewhere else. And so that 
real issue about how do you develop a risk and mistake tolerance culture, particularly where there's backgrounds of, of concerns about fraud, for me is an area that I've not seen anybody tackle well. And if the UK can do that well, you'll be world leaders. So I'd love to see it happen. I'll shut up then, um, Michael. Uh, that was quite a, a long, um, long 80 seconds. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. Thank you very much indeed, Caroline. So I've left Rory less than less than one minus minute to wrap everything up. It's been a fantastic discussion, um, but I would, would thank everyone involved. But um, as we're already out of time, I probably need just to pass over to Rory and let, let you do the do the final fanfare. Actually, I'm going to pass over to Anne. But thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, pass the parcel here. Um, so thank you uh, very much to Michael for chairing that session. Thank you to our fantastic speakers and thank you to all of you for your contributions um, in the chat. That has been a great discussion, which I've really enjoyed. Um, I think Lee's put the details of the next session in the chat. It will be focused on social value. What we're interested in trying to do is learn more about how contracting authorities set priorities for social value. So if that's something that you know about or have views about and would like to get involved, um, please uh, get in touch with Lee or Rory and uh, volunteer your services. And uh, similarly, if you have any suggestions for topics you'd like to see covered in future sessions. But thank you very much indeed, everyone, for a fantastic session today. Um, well done, brilliant.